Isn't it strange how we always seem to be looking outside of ourselves for all the answers? No matter what we buy, how we act, or what opinions we hold, no matter where we are in life, we as humans strive for the validation and recognition of others. And if we don't get it, it drives us insane. I think when we look back decades from now on our modern era, one of the defining characteristics of our generations will be our reluctance to accept responsibility and any sort of judgment alike. And the reason this is so interesting is because it's core to how we operate. And no game posed these questions better than the original Deus Ex from the year 2000. Deus Ex told a story ripe for conversations, so picking just one is a difficult task. In the game, you discover that a secret organization of Illuminati members have had control of the world for hundreds of years now. But with the advent of the internet, they started to lose their grip on societies as random people were able to quickly spread misinformation and ideas. The Illuminati, which feared for its power, had a council of five main leaders who disagreed on how to handle the situation. But eventually, one man named Bob Page won and was able to either kill, ruin, or drive out the other members, with one of the survivors being Morgan Everett, who who sets out to try and stop Bob. Bob believed that the only way to save humanity from their own doom because of the internet was to implement a series of plans in order to have himself ascend to a human-machine hybrid that he saw as a god. First, Bob would release a contagion known as the Great Death, which would kill millions, similar to COVID almost. Then he would trick governments across the world into consolidating power, after which he would imprison multiple Americans and gain control over the internet, after which he would merge with it. So overall, the game tells a story that warns of the power of the internet itself, and the harsh consequences it could have on humanity, as well as what it really means to be a god, and also asks if the world is run by an Illuminati figure. And while all these questions or ideas are fascinating in their own right, there's one question from the game that, for me at least, is a much less asked one, and also one that I personally find very fascinating. Remember Morgan Everett, another member of the Council of Five who was originally driven out by Bob? Well in game, he is the main guy who helps you take Bob down, and has created a handful of his very own AIs, some of which have become sentient, hoping they can solve the issue. Well one of these AIs is actually a prototype in Morgan's residence, and if you walk up and talk to it in game, you get this very interesting interaction. You underestimate humankind's love of freedom. The individual desires judgment, without that desire. The creation of groups is impossible, and so is civilization. Morpheus is obviously a very high level intelligence, and with that comes some interesting observations on humanity. The individual desires judgment. Without that desire, the cohesion of groups is impossible, and so is civilization. It's an interesting idea, isn't it? And quite likely true, too, because we do as humans strive for judgment. As Morpheus says, it was first the gods that judged us, and then as Nietzsche proclaimed when the gods had died, we had tried to replace them with machines. Nowadays, it's so often that we see people who cannot take judgment, that at even the very mention of any character flaws are flung into a rage, but maybe that's because we have lost our way with judgment itself. We lost the gods that once gave us reason and meaning, and without them we have been afflicted with a sickness. It's natural for us to assume we want our freedoms, freedoms to judge ourselves, to make choices, and decide the fate of our own lives. But as experiment after experiment has shown us, we as humans don't crave freedom. We crave judgment. When we are given freedom, we simply become paranoid, like the famous jelly bean experiment, where it has been observed over and over again that given the choice between a hundred different flavors of jelly beans or just two, humans almost unanimously are more happy when given less choice less freedom because it allows us to focus more and not become overwhelmed. And in our modern era now too, we see ourselves daily giving up freedoms of autonomy, speech, and even privacy to governments and big corporations that feed off our data like vampires. But as much as we want to blame these powerful forces for what has happened, maybe it was just part of the human condition all along. Because we as humans crave judgment, we don't crave freedom. We need systems and laws in place that provide us with a structure from which we can identify who we are, whether that be good or evil. Before religions provided this, they gave hope to the hopeless and meaning to the meaningless. And whether these arrangements were actually good is up to interpretation, but what they did provide was judgment, a way for us to formulate ourselves in this crazy world. And now with the advent of artificial intelligence and the internet, it seems clear that we as a species are choosing to forgo our freedom to see the world as it is, instead to create institutions that tell us how to. Maybe Bob in Deus Ex wasn't so wrong after all. 
Maybe only by once again taking power as the Illuminati could the world become right as it once was. After all, a humanity without a god, without judgment, is a humanity on the brink of destruction. But maybe, maybe he wasn't right either. And there might just be something deep within all of us that gives us that meaning, should we look deep enough. It's the argument between intrinsic and extrinsic moral value. For me, I know I crave judgment, and I know you do too. For as much as we are told to focus on ourselves, we are social creatures, and it's only in the eyes of our peers that we find meaning, our purpose, because it's in the eyes of others that we see ourselves. So the question then becomes though, can their judgment be of their own volition, a society born of society, or must we have a bigger organization, a structure for all that, which makes us human? Judging by where we are now in society, we may just be about to find out. What would you be willing to do to save your family? Would you allow yourself to become the very thing you tried to fight against in the first place for what you see as the greater good? Papers Please sets out to ask us these very questions. In the game, you play as an immigrations officer for a fictional dystopian Eastern Bloc adjacent country called Arstotska. This fake country is bordering directly with many opposing nations. And as such, you as a player play a vital role in making sure that no one gets in who shouldn't. This means that you are only paid based on passports that you correctly allow in or deny. And considering that in game you have a starving and poor family back home, including some very young children, every little ounce of money you can get counts for keeping everyone alive. And the tension in the game is what it is most known for. There are many people forging fake passports or giving sob stories about why they should get in. And only by denying entry to these starving and desperate families can you feed your very own. On top of this too, further into the game, some shady characters like mob members or corrupt politicians come to you offering large sums of money in order to illegally let people through, meaning by doing the quote unquote wrong thing, you can guarantee your family another day of food and safety. It's a game that pushes at the very core of what it means to protect those you love, and turning away helpless families from borders in order to save your own is a panic-inducing situation. Maybe the most poignant of all the moments in the game, though, comes from a man named Georgie. You first meet Georgie as a young lad trying to find entry into your country with a comically forged passport, full of scribbles and childlike drawings. It's a good laugh for an otherwise dire situation, and any player trying to make the obvious choice denies Georgie entry and sends him along his way with a wink and a smile. And time and time again, Georgie comes back with progressively more sophisticated passports, yet each time still having faults that make it obviously forged, meaning with each arrival, just as quickly as Georgie comes, you send him away again. But one day he comes to you with what seems to be a perfect passport. No errors, no scribbles, and it looks like everything checks out. And while your intuition tells you it certainly is a forgery still, there's nothing you can do to be sure, and by letting him in you almost get a sense of relief that he finally figured it out. Where this situation becomes truly interesting though is towards the end of the game, when the country you live in suddenly looks to be on the brink of war with its neighbors, meaning you and your family could be in big danger. But not only that, the government has started confiscating citizen passports in order to force people to stay and fight, meaning your family would surely die. And it's at this moment that you can now reach out to Georgie and ask him to help you forge a new identification in order for you and your family to escape. The irony of it all is that over the entire span of the game you were tasked with catching liars, cheaters, and apparently bad people, many of whom were only lying in order to save themselves from a bad situation. But in the end, you become the very thing you tried to fight against. A man and his family forging passports in order to try and get into another country. Before where you rejected so many others in order to help your own family, now you must pray that no one rejects you in order for your family to survive. It's one of the most powerful twists in an otherwise very laid back and some would say boring games that really puts into perspective just how important, well, perspective is. Because what Papers Please makes us think about is how everyone has their reasons. Before when you denied people you wished you could help, it was because you needed to help those you loved first. And then when you went against everything you originally signed up to protect, it was to protect yourself and those you loved. We as humans tend to be selfish creatures, especially in situations of immediate need. During times of struggle, turmoil, or confusion, we often turn to lying, cheating, or a distinct lack of empathy in order to satiate our needs. But too often too, when we become these things, we hurt others in the process. And as we have all been told probably too many times in our lives, life isn't fair. And many times prosperity for one must come at the expense of another. 
And this point of humanity is seen in no better situations than countries on the brink of catastrophe, where everyday people around you are suffering. So the question then becomes, should you screw over those you don't know in order to protect the ones you love? If you have to deny starving family food in order to feed your own, would that be a sacrifice worth making at the expense of your soul? Or would it simply make you a monster? The same one that had you been in the starving family's position, you would have felt rage and vitriol for. When life is calm, it's easy to be a good person. It's easy to give to others, and even more help them with whatever they need. But it's only when we are truly met with extreme hardship that we can see the character that we have inside. No one knows their strengths until they are tested, and no one knows their morality until they're in a world with none. So if papers please teaches us anything is to always question not only your own reality but the reality of those around you. Oftentimes when people are doing things you would find heinous or monstrous it may be because a monster is all they have left within them to survive. If you had to defend your family would you steal? Would you lie? Would you give up all those moral studies you learned about in your life? Would you kill? For those of you who answered that question just now in your head without ever actually being in a life or death situation you don't know. And that's what makes it scary, but also beautiful. Because truly, if there is one thing I took away from Papers, Please, it's that while we cannot always control what will happen to us, or even those we love, what we can control is how we react to it. And by remembering to always try our best to understand others and their struggles and thoughts alike, we can become people with much more understanding, and hopefully, more love. How do you find meaning in a world where God is dead? If everything you stood for, everything you fought in the name of, and all the beliefs and preconceived notions you held on to turned out to be nothing but a lie, how could you ground yourself in this brave new world? Nier Automata paints a picture of this conundrum. In the game you play as 2B, one of the many human-made androids that are fighting a proxy war against alien machine invaders that threaten the human race on Earth. And as you play throughout the game, you're met with multiple other machines and intelligences that are based on real-life philosophers and their studies. The reason this is so significant, though, is because on your first playthrough, you discover that the humans you have been fighting to save have actually been extinct for centuries. It's a massive secret being held only by a select few in the know, and it means that your sole purpose as an android to protect and serve has been lost. And these robots you meet in game with their different philosophies and ideas serve as a way for you to find purpose in a life where you now have none. For example, a robot in game named Pascal sees life as all inherently good, but his beliefs are challenged when his entire tribe turns to rabid cannibalism, at which point he questions his entire worldview and meaning because how can such horrible things happen to such great people? The real genius of the game though comes from the multiple playthroughs you can do because you realize on your second playthrough that all of those machines you have been killing actually have feelings too. The second playthrough where you play as 9S, who accompanied 2B in the first playthrough, opens with a cinematic of a robot showing emotions and family, which shows that your first playthrough could be interpreted as a mass killing event. Perspective is everything. But still, the most daring question of all in the game is the one it focuses on, finding meaning in a world with none. Because it's only after learning that humans have been gone for so long that we take into consideration more of everything we find in game. The game itself almost has no clear objectives, no guiding light to the end. It seems like every time you complete one main objective, your entire goal changes for no reason. There is no main narrative the whole way through. And that's on purpose. The game structure itself has no meaning. Because just as 2B and 9S have lost theirs, you two are simply walking through a desolate valley trying to hop from one objective to another to find significance in a world which has none. The beauty of the game is through its message, because it's only by bravely venturing out into this mysterious world that you can find your meaning. Nier Automata isn't about a war between sentient human and alien machines. It's a story about finding meaning in life when all seems lost. When God is dead, how can you recreate him from the ashes? Each boss in the game focuses on different philosophies like one who tries to dress up as beautifully as possible, seeing the meaning of life as getting admiration from others. And through each of these bosses in game you start to form your own opinion of why you as androids should continue to live on, what it is you should fight for. After all, it can no longer be humans, they're gone forever. 
So through your multiple journeys then through the same world and story, you start to garner more and more perspective on just what it is that will give these androids meaning. And while there are so many different outcomes and ways to see this story, maybe the most profound ending shows it best. Because during the so-called E ending, one of many, at the final stages of the game you have the choice to delete your save file. Yes, your full game save that you have likely been spending upwards of hundreds of hours on. But why, might you ask? Because in this ending, by deleting your save file, all the multiple runs and perspectives you have seen in game, you can aid other, real life players on their journey, and potentially help in sparking a revolution to rebuild lost friends for the future. It's only by making this grand sacrifice of what we held most close that you realize maybe you just found the meaning in this universe, in helping others, in giving up your greatest achievements in the pursuit of helping the future of your people, in helping those you don't even know on a journey they may never even see the end of. Maybe the meaning of life always came from inside, from ourselves, not from following idealistically some gods or machines, but from helping to cultivate a future worth living in. I think at the core of humanity is a sense of this, that despite all the atrocities and mistakes of history, the human race has fought on. There's a sense within all of us that even if all of our love, our desires, and our meaning was stripped away from us, we would carry on and try in our lives to create a world that would be better for our future selves, one where a new meaning could be created from the ashes of the mistakes of our past. If Nier Automata taught us anything, it's that maybe God can never die, because God was always all of us. As long as in even one of us, in our hearts, we see the passion and good in the world to help others, then God will forever be alive. The tenacity to live on, forever.